Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Lois Richter and the program is called Birding with Lois. It really should be called Birding with Lois and Friends, but that's the name of it right now. Today is the 14th of April, 2022, and this is our second show. We did our premiere last week, had a real good time, and decided to come back and just do it all over again. So here we are. So the, um, you know, we had a plan, we had a structure, it lasted one week, we're going to change it. So <laughs> we're going to start with, uh, as we did last week, we're going to have a little opener question, but then we're going to go through and we're going to do a check-in, I think we're going to call that. So let's start with the first um, question, and that is, how does one figure out what species a bird is? So if someone has, has told you about a bird and you want to figure it out, for example, Somebody said, what's that little brown bird that looks like someone turned it upside down and dipped it in ink? I saw it going around on the ground on my backyard in Davis, California on Valentine's Day. Okay. So when we get that information, somebody sends me that question, I have to know a bunch of things. And I do from what they said. What time of year was it? Valentine's Day? That's February. Where was it? Davis, California. Okay, that's good. What size was it? Well, they said it looked like a sparrow that had been dipped in ink, so it's sparrow size. Any other um, things? Well, it was dipped into ink and looks black at the top. And anything else about it? Mm, well, it was in somebody's backyard. Okay, so we've got habitat, we've got size, we've got um, a little bit about color, we've got the place and the time, which is really very important if it happens to be a migratory bird. Well, I live in Davis. I know what that bird is. That's a junko. And, and as you can see, it is a little bird dipped in black ink. All right. Notice on this, on this picture, though, in addition to the black head, notice the color of the beak. That's an important clue for juncos, and you can't quite see it, but the side of that tail is white. Let's look at another one. This one is, oh, I didn't even know that one was in there. Okay, so this is another thing. You can see the white on the tail very well here, and that's going to be easiest to see because they flit around on the ground as they're eating, and as they spread that tail, you get these white uh, tail feathers. So that one has a charcoal head and that beak again. So what next bird? Now there it is spreading its wings and you can see that tail very clearly. Notice that this it doesn't actually look black on a brown bird. This looks more like, I don't know, gray on a gray bird. Let's see another one. Oh, that one is that was the end of that. Okay, so I can't tell what that bird feeder was, but if it was uh, in the wintertime, there could have well have been a junco up there. Because we know the time, we can tell what's here. Juncos are here in Davis in the winter, and then they go elsewhere for the summer. So I'm going to go to the next question, and I'm going to turn this around a little bit, and I'm going to ask the fo folks here if someone gave you this description, and let's go to the next question. There it is. There we go. If you could change one of these criteria, place, date, habitat, size, color pattern, or behavior, what other non-junko black-headed birds might you think of? So with changing one of those, what do you think? Steve, you got one? Yes, I do, Lois. In our neck of the woods here in South Carolina, along the coast, up and down, we have the laughing gull, especially in warmer weather. You can see the picture there. Let me try an audio. That's what they sound like. And uh, it's a familiar bird. Uh, you, you see the adult uh, mature plumage in breeding season. Uh, off season, winter time, you won't see the dark head so much. It'll be kind of gray and mottled, uh, but it's still a laughing gull. I All love right. them. How about you, Chris? Well, um, last week I went out looking for a black-headed grosbeak. So um, the I happened to um, 
I happened to be in a canyon and I played the black-headed grosbeak call and he flew all the way across the canyon, landed on a bush right next to me. So, wow. Yes, he's very pretty and you can see that um, it's coming into full spring plumage. It's very pretty. So it's, um, it was a nice, it was a nice um, morning. That's a good black-headed bird. Uh, TJ, what have you got? Well, if here in Minnesota, if you say something like that, what immediately comes to mind is the, I think it's called the black cap chickadee, ah, uh, yes. you know, black, black head on top. And so, um, and they're pretty common in this area and pretty mm -hmm. much all year long. Cool. All right. Um, so let's go on to the next question. Uh, this is this is our new bit. We're going to have a weekly check-in, and basically everybody who's on the show is going to say something about what they saw or did for birding this week. So we need all all four of us in there. So let's start with oh Steve, you're far east. Yes, uh, this week I was in the Pinckney uh, Island National Wildlife Refuge. Walked ten miles. Uh, observed 47 different species and took photos and audio recordings. And um, one of the highlights there is the red-eyed vireo. It has a beautiful mm -hmm. song. It goes up, it comes down, and it lifts my spirits every time. And I uh, observed three of them with their song. That was really great. Back to you, Chris. So this, this week was a very good week of birding. There were, there's a lot of migration going on, and there was a there's a rare magnolia warbler that mm -hmm. I happened to um, that I happened to get, and so I was underneath this tree and found this um, this beautiful magnolia warbler, and then I got this amazing shot here from underneath that's that's backlit, and you can see how transparent the feathers are. And um, it was a beautiful thing. And if you if you have a chance, you can look down and see the tail feathers are kind of ragged because flying in eucalyptus trees, they end up getting stuck on the sap. So yesterday, you see, um, Tuesday morning, it was very windy here in Carlsbad. And we were down at La Jolla Cove. Let me switch this real quick. We, we were down at La Jolla Cove and we were looking out when it's windy and the and the water's coming off the ocean, we go down to the we go down to La Jolla Cove and you get your spotting scopes out and you look for seabirds. And we got a we got a call that there was a tufted duck um, that happened to be about thirty minutes away. So everybody picked up their scope and they went driving across town, and we got this um, female tufted duck. And the female tufted duck for me was is a life bird. And I chased this thing all over Michigan trying to find it. It was it was swimming with some lesser scops, and it looked very similar. And if you don't know, if you didn't know if one of the great birders around hadn't seen it, you might not know. And then um, it happened to do some nice displays for us, so you can see under under the wing. So so that's um that was my great week of birding. Well, that sounds like a fantastic. Now I understand why you wanted to do a weekly check-in. You wanted to brag, didn't you? <laughs> well, it's not bragging. I get up every morning and right now it's migration time and there's so many opportunities. This morning I saw yeah. 15 yellow warblers in a, in a park, just beautiful. So mm -hmm. right now is the best time to be a birder. All right. Um, TJ, did you happen to do any birding this week? Well, the only birding I did this week was more uh, opportunistic, as it were, and watching the birds uh, in the bird bath. We have a heated bird bath at the house, and it's been very cold here again, uh, unusually so for this time of year in spring. And so the water has actually been freezing, and the uh, heated bird bath keeps the water obviously from freezing. And so just watching the goldfinches and the purple finches um, just hang out on the bird bath. And they have their very own spa, the TJ spa. I like it. Okay, so what I did this week, now I was actually pretty 
busy doing stuff for the show. But my husband looked out and he said, "What? what's that? In fact, that's a, a question coming up in a little while. Maybe I shouldn't tell you. I'll wait till that question comes up and then I'll tell you. But anyway, um, other than that, he has counted six hummingbirds at one time at the same feeder, which for us is, is kind of unusual. Usually there's only one at a time and then somebody will come and chase it off and it'll come back. Except when the family was there, then there was the two parents and the two young ones for the Anna's hummingbirds. But a calm week for me, except for that one thing, which I'll tell you later. What's the next question? I happen to know. On, on April 8th in Davis, California, I saw a hummingbird that had a red gorget with orangish color on the back. What was it? Well, we looked in all the books. This, by the way, came from my husband. We looked in all the books and we looked at every wing and we, we, we were going, now either it's a Either it's an Allen's or it's a Rufus. And, and we determined that it was, in fact, a male Rufus hummingbird. Now, I believe I have a, a picture of a male Rufus hummingbird here. Yeah. Isn't that a gorgeous bird? Can you see that? There you go. The gorget, by the way, are those feathers, the bright red feathers. And the red on this hummingbird is different than the red on the Anna's hummingbird. It's a it's a redder red instead of a rosy red. Do you have any more pictures of a hummingbird, sir? Uh-huh, there you go. And again, you can see it. And the little part that's hanging down is the gorget. And again, this is the female. No, no, that's not right. This is another male, but you can't see the red because it's not flashing at you. So it's very, it was very subtle. And then the last one. There you go. Oh, there. We're going to stop in there. I think there's a, one of our slides that I mis misread. Anyway, so we'll come back to us now and say hummingbirds are a wonderful thing, but they don't only exist in the Americas. There are birds. Okay, Lois, now I, I'm going to put up. Yes? Lois, I, I just wanted to, I was out when I was out birding this week and I happened to get too close to a hummingbird that must have been sitting, an Anna's hummingbird that must have been sitting on a nest because it decided to display the gorget to me in full, as wide as he could get that, as wide as he mm -hmm. could get it and trying to get us to move away from the nest. So. Yeah, and that's what that's what they do. And when they when they're pointed at you, you see the color, and when they're pointed away from you, it you don't see the color. It looks basically black. All right, what have we got for another question? Steve Batty here on the panel suggests how do you identify bird songs? What resources do we have to help you learn how to identify bird songs? And I believe. I believe the first, okay, I've got to, got to look. The first one is mine or is, well, put up the first slide, Josh, and then we'll know which one it is. No, nope, that's the second slide. Okay, so uh, I guess the first slide didn't work. Anyway, the first one, Steve is going to talk about the academy at allaboutbirds.org. Go ahead, I, Steve. Thanks, Lois. Uh, you can learn bird songs from the Bird Academy, Cornell, uh, New York. The Lab of Ornithology is a great resource for all kinds of birding. And they have uh, a website I'll give to you. It's academy.allaboutbirds.org. And you search a little bit and you'll see learn how to identify bird songs. It's a free, there's a video. And and there's text that goes with it. <laughs> Josh has that up now, Josh. Let's show that. Peewitty, peewitty, peewitty. Quick three beers. Drink your tea. Drink your tea. I will see you, and I'll seize you, and I'll squeeze you till you squirt. You can think that this is the warbling vireo talking to the insect. I will see you, and I'll seize you, and I'll squeeze you till you squirt. <laughs> okay. That's Before I could identify bird songs, they all sort of blended together. Learning how to identify bird songs by ear is 
super important to develop great birding skills. And the cacophony or the ensemble of birds that are singing really give me like a sense of place. It's for me like wearing a, a comfortable blanket. I feel secure when I know who's singing around me. It makes me feel like I'm maybe a secret governmental agent who's always aware of their surroundings. They know where, where everybody's seated in a room, right? So it's kind of like that. <laughs> it allows me to go out. Okay, the that's enough. Any time of year. Thank you, Josh, for showing us. By the way, I should introduce Josh Kaufman, who is the person who's doing our media management. There he is. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Okay, so Steve, um, that was the the video that you were wanting to show, right? Uh, yes. Uh, also, actually, I use Merlin in the field, also from the uh, Cornell Labs. It's merlin.allaboutbirds.org. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, download the app to your phone, take it out and feel like I did uh, this Monday going to the Pinckney uh, Wildlife Reserve and play the app. It'll listen to the bird or birds and it will give you suggestions on what they are. Usually right. You do have to be a little careful to confirm back, but uh, it's one of the best uh, bird ID apps that I've used. Another one that I used more often and I still do a little bit is BirdNet, also from Cornell, birdnet.cornell.edu. Also very helpful in the field. Okay. Um, and I came up with, I did a little research on this, and I came up with two. The, I was, I went to Macaulay Library and I don't know if you about, know about Macaulay Library, but it's a place where you can go and you can look up pictures, videos, and sound recordings. So if you could show me that little sound recording there. That is a picture of the recordings of, uh, this happens to be a Eurasian collared dove, just because I needed a sound. And we're not going to play any of them. But you can go in there and you can listen. And these are recordings that people have made and then submitted to Macaulay Library. And the next one... Excuse me. The next one, please. And this is a, a wonderful YouTube on teaching children about birds. So if you can start at the beginning, please, because he's halfway through already. There we go. Bird sounds is what it's called. Cardinal. Okay, and we're not going to play all Crow. of these. Crow, crow. <laughs> anyway, it. Yes, I heard you. Um, anyway, it's a very nice thing, and it's made for children, so it is simple. They're going to to play one call for a particular bird. Birds don't just stop at one call. Sometimes the same bird will make different calls, and I don't mean mockingbirds that are pretending to be somebody else. I mean just sometimes birds have more than one call. But anyway, that gets you a little bit about that. Okay, I've talked enough. Chris, do you want to weigh in on any of this? Well, I was going to concur with Steve that the Merlin app to me is a game changer for people that bird a lot. Um, I went out in the field this morning, and it gave me six different birds that were singing all around me. So you can if you're, if, unless you're a musician and have really good ears, you can hear the sound, but you don't really know what it is. And it tells you that, okay, those are yellow warblers singing around me, or those are common yellow throats. And then you just turn and follow the sound and then get your binoculars on it. So it's um, the Merlin app to me, they've figured out a way to actually identify songs. Um, right now they have about 500 in the Merlin app and they're, it's very accurate. Great. TJ, you got anything? Yeah, what my wife and I did, uh, oh, must be at least 10 years ago now, we had a CD that had mm. um, bird songs on it. And, um, you know, it, it would play the song and then it would tell you what the bird is. And so we had that in our car. And so when we were just going on little trips around town, we just popped that in and just kind of listened to it. And after a while, you get used to hearing that particular mm -hmm. song. And then you're like, oh, that, you know, that's the cardinal or that's the blue jay trilling or whatever. And so um, it, it just hearing it over and over and um, hearing them, okay, this is 
you know, like the old sea and say, this is a bird. And you would hear the robin there. Um, and that's how I know that that's the robin and the sea and say. But um, just hearing that over and over and, and kind of that repetition just kind of cements it into your brain. And so then now it's like I'm sitting at my desk. I can hear the birds outside. I'm like, oh, there's a cardinal out there or there's a blue jay out there or something. So I can tell what's just outside just by hearing it. That's very good. And it's very, very fine that you all can do that. And, you know, the older you get, the less hearing you have. <laughs> so the harder it is for me to hear those high squeaky ones. So people will be walking around with me and I'm doing a bird tour and they'll go, what's that? And I'm going, what's what? You know, it's a high squeaky little, no, sorry. But one of the fun things is that if you have a good bird app and we will get to that a little bit in the show to, to what bird apps you can have that you can if you find a species of bird usually they will have recordings several recordings of what kinds of noises that bird makes and so if you know that you're there you're in a particular place and you you think you you know what that bird is it is not um, proper etiquette to go out into a bird's habitat and play distress calls or play mating calls or any of those things. I was like, that's rude. But in your own home, when you're trying to figure out what things are, perfectly fine. Or if you play it just really softly so you can compare what you're hearing to what the, the thing has, that, that's fine. That's just, okay, I, I think we've done that question, haven't we? Let's try another one. Uh, here we go. Now this is, question is, are there any good and free videos to watch to help me learn to bird and i'm going to recommend one that is um it's a youtube video but it was made by the cornell university folks so josh have you got that one queued up for us that's it and just play just a little bit So these two are professional. And we're just in a small woodlot. Um, it's only about 10 or 15 acres. And you can see that there's a great mix of habitat. We've got some tall trees, more shrubs, all these. Okay, that's enough. That's enough for that one. Um, they have an entire series on learning how to bird. And they go from everything from how do you decide what size something is? How do you figure out what are the important things to know about? So it's a very, very good series. And um, then the next one is another one called Inside Birding. Wait a minute. That was Inside Birding, wasn't it? Okay, have you got another video up there? Maybe not. We're doing this new procedure where, where we find the videos and then we send them over to the media manager and sometimes there's a little typo or something. So we will assume that there is not, but Inside Birding is a series. I would suggest you go to Cornell and find out about it. Okay, Steve, what have you got? Your mic's off. Are we still going over birding apps? Uh, we're doing videos to watch on your okay. computer um, later, not not apps to carry around with you. That's later. This one is uh, Audubon.org. And I like to go birding at night with the night jars, whippoorwills, Chuck Will's widow, and the nighthawk. And I'm on the Audubon.org site, and I scroll down to Welcome to the Dark Side your guide mm. to nocturnal uh, birding. And it has a whole host of videos, pictures, audios. Uh, there's one of your favorite hummingbirds. Um, and uh, I'll just play this a little bit. See if anybody recognizes it. I should have screened that first, get hard to hear it. The <laughs> Picknell's Thrush. Uh, again, this is Audubon.org. We haven't talked about this site yet. It's uh, something I have on my computer, but not on my phone. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the next question, which is right back to Steve, because he put in the question. He's going to answer the question. It's a Steve show. Someone said, what's a spotting scope? You're on, Steve. Okay. Uh, spotting scope is kind of like the binoculars that Lois had talked about in an earlier show. Uh, but it is a monocular for one eye. Mine 
is a Barkskis uh, 20 to 60 power. So this allows me to go much further out than the binoculars and uh, be able to look out a quarter mile, half a mile, and be able to identify birds. And I have used it, especially on the shore, looking out at mud flats. Any long distance birding spotting scope is a great thing to have. Go, Chris. Well, a spotting scope is really a telescope. It's there. There are typically two kinds of spotting scopes. One with an angular, so um, with an angular lens, so that um, you can look down from above, or you can, um, or a straight spotting scope, so you can look through. Typically, the angled spotting scope will allow other people to look in your scope for you. If you have a straight scope, it's usually up at the height where your eyes are. Um, the, the thing about the spotting scope is that it lets in so much light. And if you get good, good glass and you have up to 60 or 70 power, you can see a long way, but they have to be on a tripod, typically a good tripod and they're heavy, they're hard to carry around and you have to find places to put them in your car. And so they're a little bit cumbersome, but there are some types of birding that it's impossible to do without. You have to have one. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, say that, see, I don't have a spotting scope. What I do is I attach myself to birding tours. I find out where the local Audubon Society is and they're gonna have a, a tour about this or that or the other thing, I'll go join them. And people always have a scope to, to look at. Now, I only use it when I'm looking at things that don't move, like ducks on the water. Well, I mean, they, they paddle around a little bit, but they're not flying. Uh, it, taking a spotting scope and trying to get a little warbler in the bush is not going to work because those things don't stay put. <laughs> so, um, and so as far as getting one, they're they're expensive, but you know, if you get serious about this, you may end up buying more gear. All right, anybody else have anything on this question? Let's see what our next question is. Oh, yes, I like this one. Now, Mike Johnson wrote in a few weeks ago when we were just practicing. And Mike from Lafayette in the U.S. says, local migration timing by species would be of interest. Are there places to look up where birds are and where they migrate? And I'm sorry, Chris, I accidentally bumped you, so you have to re restart. So, Steve, I think you were the first one on this. Microphone. Microphone. I'm sorry. Thank you, Lois. I use birdwatchersdigest.com. And it gives uh, birding by region. I'm looking at the South Carolina birding by season, which is now spring. I scroll down and it's talking about the bird migrations here at this time. Some of the hot spots to, lo to look in, the timing, late April through early May, uh, some of the birds to look for. Now, there are also in the same place, uh, where your location is, you could look for the West Coast, or you could look for certain eco regions within your area. Uh, there's a lot of great resources in here. And now, I think Josh has a picture of that, doesn't he? Is that it? Yeah. Yes. That that's the birdcast. That's the next one, Josh. The the previous slide at birdwatchersdigest.com. That's it right there. It's a great site to answer directly that question. Now the next slide, please, uh, talks about BirdCast. This is a live website. I'm clicking the button. It is telling me in real time, and I'm gonna stop it right here. Uh, April 14th, 2022 at 1935, that's 735. That's about an hour ago, Eastern time now. Uh, there were approximately 15.3 million birds in flight. It shows, as you can see in the picture, uh, US map and those shaded areas, the blue 
is low migration. The orange red is a little higher migration and you don't have the one with the line, but if you were to go a little further, it shows the migration line north-south on the east coast. It goes right through where I live in Beaufort, South Carolina. So this is an excellent one. Again, it's birdcast.info and look for the maps. Back to you, Lois. Microphone, Lois. Thank you. <laughs> uh, did we get the Bird Watchers Digest in there too? I think. All right. So yes. I'm going to tell you about one. Um, there's a couple of things. Now, the thing that is going to be up on the screen right now is from the iBird Pro app. And what it does is any species that you look up, you can look at the map and it will show you the range. And it will show you where it is in the summer, where it is in the winter, migrations. Um, so it's a very useful tool and it, it has that for every single bird. And then let's go to this next one. If you can't find your uh, information in a generalist sort of way, like we've been talking about here, sometimes you'll find specifics. Now this is a blog spot, blog, and they are talking about migrant warblers. And so they have created their own maps with their own migration site. And as you can see, this particular warblers, they're going down one side and they come up the other side. But so if you don't find anything in general, if it's a specific species, yeah, go check it out. All right. Are we done with that one? I think. Just one more. Go ahead. So to go to piggyback on Steve's um, thing tonight on BirdCast, there are 85 million birds predicted to migrate into the U.S. This is the prediction map from them. So 15 million at the moment, which Steve was saying, but 85 million tonight. So that's how wow. that's, migration is happening. That's impressive. I mean, just the picture is impressive. <laughs> All right. I got to ask, how in the world are they going to know how many birds there are? I mean, nobody's going to go out and count them. Because eBird, eBird can tell how many birds are being reported and the radar can tell how many birds are in flight. So mm. they can, and so what happens on the radar, so if there's a big strong headwind and 85 million birds are coming in and there's a big storm front coming down, then that's when you get all of these, the birds drop as soon as they get over to the shore. And that's how from the movie, The Big Year, when they were chasing the, the birds that just dropped, um, that's how they did it because of the headwinds that they have to fly, because they're flying over water mostly, except the ones in Texas. So. Okay, uh, next question. So this is again from Roy Myers in Maryland, and he writes, there is a red-tailed hawk nearby. Is there some peculiarity of their behavior that I might find an, an optimal time to try and photograph it? Now, I'm not sure if we didn't, cover this last week but we maybe we did maybe we didn't I don't remember anyway so red tail hawk what you need to find out is their habitat what kind of place they like perhaps how they hunt they are a very large bird and their feet are very large so this foot it could it could be on a post that would be fine but it, it can't hold on to a wire because the feet are too big so if you see a hawk on a wire it's not a red tail um, but if you find that they're hunting in a particular field and there's a post there that they like to hang out on, you know, just drive by and stick your head out the window and take a picture. <laughs> I mean, that's not a really great way. And it may not answer a peculiarity of their behavior because to my mind, their behavior is that they soar overhead, they sit on a pole, and then they swoop down and, you know, pick up lunch. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to say about, about well, the red that flight? The red tails, the easiest way to photograph a red tail is when it's in the air because you can look up and see the red tail, mm -hmm. typically backlit by the sun. Um, you can find them sometimes early morning sitting on top of telephone poles because they look like big large blobs and um, usually with dark backs and kind of a V formation on their back. 
but um, they're very popular. They, their habitat is anywhere in the United States. Um, in Mexico, they're one of the most um, prolific um, species of hawks out there. They prolific hunters. So no, you can't sit there. He's not going to come back to a feeder. <laughs> but um, but it's uh, you did most of the time you can see one. It, Steve can probably tell you go out every day and you can see red tail hawks out there. Well, let's look at the next question, because this, this segues really well right into that. And this one from Minneapolis, TJ Asher. Hello, TJ. Does the panel have any tips for getting decent pictures of birds? And I'm going to call on you first, TJ, to see if you, if, is there any more you want to explain or what you're doing? Well, I'm sort of throwing the ball to myself a little bit here, although, um, you know, it I, there's lot of talent here on getting pictures on birds but the what i would advice i would offer is get as close as you can first um, some birds allow you to get closer some birds don't um, so whether you actually get physically closer or you have to have a lens that allows you to bring that bird closer just kind of like we do with binoculars or a spotting scope um, and depending on how far away the bird is you know, sometimes you might need to bring out something like this, um, you know, to, to get closer, as it were. Um, so this is a 400 millimeter lens. Um, it weighs about 12 pounds. Definitely needs to be on a tripod uh, when you're using something like that. Um, and they do make special gimbal heads to allow you to be able to try to track birds in flight. Um, the other thing I would, the next piece of advice I would offer is... Um, Watch your background because um, our brain has a great ability to sort of isolate what we're looking at and, and we can kind of ignore everything else that's in the background. But when you're taking a picture, the camera doesn't ignore anything, it, it sees everything. So even though we're saying, oh, look at this, you know, little chickadee or a yellow warbler or something on the branch, well, when you take the picture, then suddenly all you see is just branches and everything going all over the place. So it really makes it hard to see your subject in a photograph compared to when you are looking at it live and your brain is filtering out all the unnecessary stuff it doesn't want to look at. So just pay attention to your background. And if you can maybe change your angle a little bit to get a background that's slightly less busy and full of stuff, that will also um, improve your photograph. Great. Okay, Steve, you want to chime in on this one? Hey, I think we're thanks. all going to say something. Yeah. Well, one thing I would say is find out where the birds are. There are places around you uh, that people know about and talk about. You can find them on eBird or Facebook or wherever. Get to where the birds are, like a rookery. Uh, we have a cypress wetlands nearby that has white ibis, snowy egret, gray egret, common gallinule by the hundreds in there. And there are walkways around it. Beautiful place for photos. Uh, another tip I might have is I started birding about two years ago with my smartphone. Well, that's great for taking selfies and things like that, but it's not great for birding. Try to get a, if you're gonna get a little more serious, I did with a, a Nikon uh, D3500. Right now they're about 500 dollars on Amazon. So that's, that's not a small decision for people like me, but it made a world of difference. I don't quite have the money for that 400 millimeter, I think Chris showed. <laughs> but mine goes out to 300 millimeter, that's six power. And that gets most of what I need uh, for the more distant pictures. And um, you don't ever talk about audios here. That's another day. Another day. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Chris. So I birded for 40 years without a camera. Um, mm -hmm. Got a, Spent my money on a great pair of binoculars. And um, I went with a lot of people. I didn't feel like carrying around the camera because when you go out birding and you have a big lens like that, TJ, the, the, there's, it's a lot of weight. You're afraid of going through the brush and banging it, your stuff. So I ended up this year, I, I was birding with somebody and he had a really nice camera and a really nice spotting scope. And I said, boy, you're brand new into birding, and, but you bought really good gear. And he goes, you can't take it with you. So, <laughs> so I went out and just got a, um, a Sony point and shoot. It's, um, 
it's a uh, it's a little bit more expensive than Steve's, but it's you know like fifteen hundred dollars. But it goes out to it's got a a fixed lens, but it goes out to six hundred millimeter, mm -hmm. and and so if you can hold it, so I can go out and get pictures, and I clip it to my belt, and I have this little attachment that just clips to my belt, so I don't even need any straps. It's like a holster, and it works really well because I'm not doing it for National Geographic photos. I'm doing it to identify the birds. And the, I come back, mm -hmm. I fill up the cartridge and I come back and I look through Lightroom and I try to figure out how to lighten them up so I can see facial features and try to identify them. And then if I still can't identify them, I all of us know somebody that's a better birder than us. And so then I'll send those, I'll send those pictures to one of the eBird reviewers and say, is this a gray vireo or is this a Hammond's vireo? You know, and um, so so, and then I usually get back the wrong answer that I thought it was. So, <laughs> it's, um, camera is it's camera is a lot of fun if you're especially if you're new into birding. Um, mm -hmm. You try not to find you know get a point and shoot so you can go out and, and with a little bit of lens so you can um, you can actually learn to identify birds. Yeah, and bird. Bird pictures are beautiful, and, and it's amazing the shots that some people get. I like to go and <laughs> look at Macaulay Library and look at the pictures out there. And you can say, okay, I want to see, um, oh, yellow warbler. Thousands and thousands of pictures of yellow warbler. Well, you can search, you can filter the search, and you can sort the search. And so I say, okay, show me the best the best pictures. And then I will go and I'll look at those and I'll go now, so these are the best pictures. Okay, why is why is this picture better than the picture I took of Yellow Warbler? And I can see what GJ's talking about. The background is clear or maybe there's stuff in it, but it's it's blurred. They call that bokeh. And, um, but I can see the bird. I can see the whole bird. The bird is, yeah. So being inspired by other people's photographs is a fun thing to do. If I want to take a picture, usually it's because I'm at my house and something has showed up and I'm going, oh wow, look at that. That's a Rufus hummingbird. And I want to take a picture or I want to make a, 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 a hummingbird cam so that I can do that. And I think on another show, we're going to have to talk about how to make a, a, a webcam, a bird cam. Okay, but for right now, tips for getting decent pictures of birds. Well, see the bird, have a decent camera, and pay attention. Okay, what's the next picture, uh, the next uh, question? Okay, again, Ray Franklin. Oh, this one. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Ray Franklin, who is from Florida, and is, uh, when we were preparing to do the show, he would come on, he would be one of our, one of our faces, because we didn't have all the panelists then. And so he would come on and stuff. And over the months that we were working, Ray would come and he'd ask a question and I'll, you know, I'll go through a whole story of his questions anyway. But lately he's just been sending us a picture or two or a video or something and said, what's this? So here's Ray's question today. Three birds are peckering around on the ground after one of them flies up and does his or her best to trigger the feeder. Now this is a droll, um, a dr what's it called? Droll Yankee, that's it. So can we play that video, please? And then... Okay. So what that, what the, the feeder is, the feeder has... Okay, that's enough of that. So the feeder has a... Um, a, a edge here and there is a little bird holder here and when you sit on it you can get your little beak in there and get some seed but it is weighted so that if some heavy bird comes on it the perch goes down and it shuts off the feeder and there's no food coming out 
is to discourage those big black grackles that are so common in Calif in uh, Florida. Anyway, so he got this wonderful feeder, and it was working really well, except for a couple of things. And one was the this bird has figured out how to flutter, almost land, and then flick some stuff out, and then it'll be on the ground. So did anybody notice what bird that was on the ground there? Yes, it was a morning dove. Okay, I and couldn't tell if it was a morning dove or a Eurasian collared dove, so morning yeah. dove, okay. Yeah, three morning doves, and, the, and they typically eat off the ground. If they're mm -hmm. smart, they'll, they, um, w w if they can get into a feeder, they'll get into the feeder, but they typically eat off the ground, so. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these these were just flicking some seed out. My guess is that some seed had spilled, and as they were working their way around on the ground, they found some seed and went, oh, up, because they were smart enough to figure that one out. Anybody else want to weigh on this one? I think that, uh, Josh, did you have something? Oh, no, that was for the video. Thank you. <laughs> Our procedures, you see, since Josh is the media manager, and if we want to show a video with a person, then we have to put, anyway, never mind. TJ. Um, yeah, so I can speak to the effectiveness of those uh, droll Yankee feeders. I've got three of them in my yard, mm -hmm. and they work really well, especially for keeping squirrels out of them. Um, I don't have such a problem with other birds like grackles trying to get the seed. I have problems with squirrels trying to get at them. So they work extraordinarily well for keeping squirrels out. And what I have noticed is the finches tend to be super finicky. They, you know, we put in a songbird mix and, and I don't know if that's where finicky comes from, from finch, but the, um, the finches are like, you know, they're, they're just digging through. And it's like, nope, 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 don't want that. Don't want, oh, I'll take this one. And then they're just digging through and they're just shoveling bird seed out onto the ground. Well, then, of course, the squirrels are just hanging out underneath going, yeah, okay. And then also have morning doves walking around underneath the feeders as well, just going, yep, okay, it's just raining food on top of me. This is great. So that's one of the, um, one of the discussions we had with Ray was how to make it the least um, messy because if you have a mixed seed feed that you're putting out then they will absolutely and it isn't just the finches and lots of those little birds will go i don't want this i don't want that oh I, don't, I want that one but if you put out a single seed that most of them like and i use chopped sunflower seeds um, it's called medium chip when you buy it at uh, poultry stores and stuff like that. And it's chopped up so it cannot grow. So you don't have that problem of all those millet things growing on the ground. And a, not, a lot of it is thrown away so you don't get that slimy mess underneath. I guess I'm not being very um, <laughs> encouraging to people to put out bird feeders, but it really, it, it takes care of a lot of the problems. And most of the small birds that are going to be at your feeder are going to really, really enjoy that sunflower seed because it's just the meat. It doesn't have all those white shell, uh, black shells or anything. Very high nutrition. Yeah. Okay, so I don't think we actually told the backstory to this. Now, Ray came, the first time he came, he said, I have this problem with these these grackles coming and eating the the bird seed that I want to feed my little birds with. And he showed us a picture of, of a of a feeder and it looked like a little birdhouse. And then it had a compressed suet, seeds and suet sort of nailed to the to the thing. And then there was this little roof to keep the water off. And so we talked about, well, maybe making the roof bigger so that the, the little ones could get in, the big ones couldn't. And, we, nah, 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 nah. and then somebody said, ah, and I think it was TJ, droll Yankee. And so Ray went, okay, we'll do that. Then he came, what, what bird seed should I think? Uh -huh. Convinced him to get chopped medium chip sunflower seeds, and he did that. And he, it was great. It, it cured his grackle problem no problem and he had it out behind his house he lives in florida and there is a lake 
behind his house. Between him and the lake, there's a walking path and then some vegetation. So he put his bird seed out there. And none of the big birds that landed on it could eat it. But he has sandhill cranes. <laughs> sandhill cranes are huge birds. And so they would just, they wouldn't land on it, so it wouldn't close. And they'd just go in there and they'd get some, throw it out for the babies and stuff. So anyway, yeah, Ray has been having fun. He, um, he told me that it's all my fault that he's gone out and spent all that money on gear. Okay, um, how are we doing? We're doing, I've got about another 10 minutes. Let's go on to that next question. Here it is. JD in California asks, what are some good apps for my phone? Oh, first, so I will put my picture up, and it is allaboutbirds.org. has a review of the best iPhone apps for learning bird songs. And is that, have you got that, Josh? Mm, not sure what he's got, but anyway, all about birds and look for their review of iPhone apps and they compare all the different ones, what does what, what doesn't do what, that sort of thing. Steve, you have a couple of uh, references here too, so let's get you up in there. Uh, thank you, Lois. Um, I mentioned it before, my main uh, walking bird app is Merlin. Uh, it's uh, merlin.allaboutbirds.org. Uh, it is a download for your phone, or you can use it on your computer. And I go out there, and it will do photo IDs. So you take a photo, upload it to the Merlin photo ID, and it has uh, artificial intelligence, which will analyze what it sees and give you recommended uh, suggested birds. Also, for sounds, as I discussed earlier, you hear bird sound, you punch up the Merlin app, and it will artificially intelligence uh, look at what comes in, and it'll tell you what recommended birds. That's That one's very good. I think it was Chris, if I'm not mistaken, who mentioned that was a, one of his mainstay bird ID tools, too. So and those are the, You had another one, which was BirdNet? Uh, BirdNet is sound ID, mm. and uh, I use that to augment the Merlin. The Merlin ID is a little newer. They both come out of Cornell. Uh, BirdNet has been around a little bit longer. Uh, it is good for the short trills that perhaps Merlin doesn't pick up. As I had said, I was at the Pinckney uh, Refuge on Monday, and there were a few short pieces on my auto recording that Merlin wouldn't pick up. I went to BirdNet. I was able to capture it there. And um, Audubon.org uh, is great for, it doesn't have artificial intelligence, but you can look at birds, hear their calls, see what they look like, uh, adult, immature, different seasons. And uh, that's very helpful too, Audubon.org. Okay, Chris? Well, I go out, I probably, I have a folder on my iPhone with a, a lot of bird apps in there. So my main, my mainstay is um, Sibley's Guide to Birds. Um, I've been using Sibley's Guide for a long time. The, the one that um, I'm using a lot more now too is the Merlin app. And the Merlin app has a feature in it. I don't know if you know it, Steve, but you can if you capture a sound of a bird you want, you can actually tag it to your eBird account. So it'll just like a photo, you can you can um, mm -hmm. keep the media from directly from the Merlin app and have it populate into your eBird account. So I have a, a whole slew of ones. I have uh, ones called Birds INA, which to me is one of the best apps if you're traveling because it'll tell you what birds you need in a certain locale. So if I'm if I'm happening to go visit family or something like that, I'll open up the app and it'll say, you need these three birds for your life list, or you need these <laughs> three birds for Florida, and it'll tell you where they are. So it's, um, there are a lot of apps and um, anybody that has any questions, please email Lois um, at the link at the bottom of YouTube and we'll get you some information on where we, what apps we think are great. And it's right there on your screen, birdingwithlois at gmail.com. 
Okay, anyone else want to chime in on this one? If not, we'll move on to the next. And this is from me. Um, I've heard white crown sparrows called Zona something. What is that word and what species does it refer to, Chris? Well, the it's a it's the Latin term for um, white crown sparrow and um, Zona trichia leucophrys, but who I don't use Latin terms very often. There are five um, Zona uh, sparrows and um, so it's typically it's a white crown sparrow and um, there are golden crown sparrows are in the same in the same class. Okay. All right. And next we have now this is the other one from Ray. Uh, he's again the same fellow in Florida with the with the birds. So he did another video and sent them to us. Could you show that video, please? And so these are obviously ducks. I'm hoping to get a look at the, the male's tail. And do I see a curl on the end of that tail? A little hard to tell here. Okay, thank you, uh, Josh. So I think there are mallards something, but I'm not sure. Chris, you have any ideas on this one? Uh, I'm sure they're a hybrid mallard. mallard. The female looks like a typical mallard. Um, Mallards are pretty adaptable in the breeding season, and they, they will um, they will mate with any anything close to um, into their species, and um, so you you can see you can see a lot of mallard types. So there's there's a couple of different types. There's the there's the mallards that are out in the wild, or there's the mallards that stick in the same pond over and over again. The ones that stay in your pond typically can breed with anything that's in the pond. So it's um, and it looks yeah. like there's a pond right behind Ray's, right, yeah. right behind Ray's house. With yes, a, there definitely is. Yeah. A great egret and a snowy egret in the background, I saw. So. so one of the things about mallard hybrids is the the curl at the end of that mallard tail tends to be dominant. So if you see a duck and it's got a curl at the end of the tail, I think that's got a mallard in the woodpile. And also the domestic ducks, uh, most of many of which are mallards that have simply been bred and bred and bred and bred until they look a certain way. I was like saying a dog and a dachshund and a great Dane. Yeah, they're both dogs. They've just been bred by people to look a certain way. All right. Well, we're getting close to the end of the hour. We're going to end this and do a little two minute round robin here. Name a common hawk in your area. And this is going to be for everybody. So we'll start with Chris and then go to Steve and TJ and me. So there are typically four common hawks in, in San Diego area. One, if I went out there, the most common probably is Cooper's hawk. Um, very okay. fast, bird eating, a bird eating hawk um, will go flying through neighborhoods and try to take birds off of um, that are that are flying or off trees. Um, they will eat rodents also, so, but they're very fast. Okay. Steve. The red shouldered hawk is most common here. Uh, the red tailed hawk, a similar, a little bit larger size, is also fairly common. The red shouldered is lighter underneath and its tail uh, does not have the banding of a red tailed hawk. The red tailed hawk also, if you look at it from above, it has typically a red, reddish tail. And Josh has a picture of a red-shouldered hawk to put up, I think. Well, maybe not. Okay, TJ, what you got? Well, now, Lois, you're exposing me as the non-birder of the group because <laughs> I have absolutely no idea what the most common hawk in my area is. So I'm hoping you guys can tell me, <laughs> what's the most common hawk in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area? 
Oh, that's a hard one. I have not lived in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan for years, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pass it that. We'll come back to this some other time. We'll use it as, the, as a, a closer again, and we'll talk about hawks. So that's it. We're, we're at the end of our hour. I want to thank you all for joining us and thank the panelists for being with us and thank you for everybody who sent in questions. And if you have questions to send in, you can send them to this picture right here, birdingwithlois at gmail.com. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>